All right. Uh, welcome to the second day of the uh, 14th annual workshop on CHAM++ and applications. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, uh, Professor Thomas Sterling. Um, he's a, a professor of informatics and computing at Indiana University, and he's also a chief scientist at the uh, uh, Exascalar, Extreme Scale Oriented Center there called uh, CREST. Um, he got his PhD in 1984 from MIT. Uh, and most of us, most of you for sure, know him as uh, the father of Beowulf uh, clustering technology, which was a significant contribution to the uh, overall parallel computing field in the 90s. Um, I met him first, or maybe uh, when he was, uh, maybe that's what I remember as meeting him first when he was talking about HTMT. Which is uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a project for, uh, that was trying to transcend the limits of uh, uh, computing uh, technology uh, that were seen at that time, and if you look it up, you will see how much of out of box uh, thinker uh, 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 Thomas is. Of course, uh, he is well known for all his uh, work uh, and uh, and expounding of views on the extreme scale computing over the years. Uh, he has been developing the uh, a parallax uh, uh, execution uh, model and popularizing or uh, making people learn about the idea of execution models, which is uh, very important, as we all uh, believe here as well, and uh, expounding of, uh, exploring of the ideas of the, ex uh, uh, of, uh, uh, the program, parallax programming model through a, uh, generations of the implementations through the HPX uh, system, HPX 5.0 in particular, um, and uh, most uh, of all, I think I remember, I, 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 I know Thomas as, an, uh, as uh, a, a belonging to the school of thought that we all subscribe to here, which deals with asynchrony uh, as, as a pri uh, one of the primary important uh, attributes among uh, several others, but at least that's one common element uh, uh, that we have uh, between us. And um, and uh, and novel uh, programming methodologies, rather than uh, sticking with uh, uh, stuff that that uh, that we have been using for years and years, just because we have been using it for years and years. So, uh, so I think I think uh, uh, it, it will be great to hear from him about uh, his views on HPC runtimes, um, opportunities, requirements, and examples. Sanjay, thank you very much. And I cannot adequately tell you how much of a pleasure it is uh, to, uh, to be giving a presentation at this uh, uh, workshop. Ordinarily, I would spend the next 45 minutes or so telling the audience everything you already know. So this is this rare occasion when, in fact, I can now uh, after a brief uh, introduction, just so that we're using the same terminology, that we can um, uh, dig more deeply. And in fact, I'm going to show you some results that are less than a week old. Uh, uh, I did make a point of looking at them myself this morning, but uh, we're almost on the same page here. So uh, let, let, me, let me just broadly, first of all, rules of engagement. Uh, this is a difficult field in which to engage, right? Uh, if um, I submit a paper and I uh, fail uh, and I, we provide numbers, which I, and I'm going to show you lots of numbers, uh, I, I surprise numbers, the reviewer will come back, usually somebody's graduate student, how come you didn't provide us comparative analysis with, say, an MPI implementation? So, so we submit the next paper. And um, uh, we, uh, we include information about various forms of, of uh, uh, alternative representations. We do so naively uh, as a as base function, something to help position uh, the empirical results that we're getting so that we can be better informed. So immediately the reviewer comes back and why are you complaining about MPI? MPI is the right thing. It's been used for the last 20 years. Or in those rare occasions when perhaps the numbers may appear somewhat better using an alternative technique, well, you shouldn't have used that example or you shouldn't have used that code. So there's no winning here. All right, so why do I bring this up? 
nothing I'm about to say is intended to be competitive. This is not uh, runtime system approaches versus static systems. This is not um, uh, HPX versus Charm++. Plus Plus. Uh, this is not uh, anything else versus MPI or MPIX. What this is is a uh, work in progress information that is relevant to this workshop, data that we have accumulated that shows some strengths and opportunities and shows some uh, worrisome uh, trends as well that, that are, are additional challenges. The way you appreciate this work is you get into it up to your elbows. So let's, let's start with a metaphor. Um, speaking about up, up, up close and personal, uh, I was with... Um, uh, Dan Stanzione, who is the director of the Texas Advanced uh, Computing Center. Uh, this was not in Texas, this was in South Africa. And um, at, uh, while we were had been talking about many things related to many aspects of computing, at this particular moment, we were closely focused on, on this question. And that really was, for us, what was the, uh, the elephant in the room? And the elephant in the room for this community, you may disagree, but I think you'll at least uh, accept that it's on the short list, is the end of Moore's Law. We'll, we'll even argue what it means. Uh, Bill Gropp, who will be on the panel this afternoon, will tell you Moore's Law already ended. Uh, others will tell you, well, we're not down to five or seven nanometers yet in, in um, a technology which is being uh, commercially distributed. Uh, I will argue that for strong scaling problems, uh, Moore's Law is already irrelevant, and, um, and that for a narrow ranger of problems, there's still another seven to ten years in there. But whatever the answer is, the focus today is on the fact that the technology trend that we have been riding for 25 years, and some will argue, given Gordon Moore's uh, uh, statements go back to around 1970 in this regard, uh, for, the, for the last 40 years. There is no more free ride uh, to the next orders of magnitude in performance gain. We are approaching nanoscale technology, and unless atoms change dramatically, uh, uh, th that is going to be the granularity, not to mention the quantum effects that will uh, uh, challenge us. In addition, and while related, uh, still somewhat different is the uh, issues of power. You all know this. You've got a big machine down the, down the street, and, and its biggest challenge is sucking up energy and throwing out heat. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, Bill Kramer and others have, have resolved that uh, well, but every major gain be, may become more significant. It's interesting to note, if I may make a sidebar comment, that the next uh, 100 petaflops era machines have emphasized the importance of achieving power efficiency and the increase from on the order of 10 to uh, 100 petaflops and their long tails on either side of that uh, will not require an order of magnitude in power consumption according to the next design points. For me, uh, and others will disagree, parallelism is the uh, important part of the achievement that needs to be accomplished for, uh, uh, for moving us into the trans uh, exascale performance regime. There are others, but, but without uh, adequate parallelism, not only can we not sustain uh, the uh, pr a class of weak scale problems which are growing, but we can't even touch the strong scale problems that even today don't fall within even an order of magnitude of the, no of the uh, scaling of the systems. And the headroom to um, uh, achieve greater performance is in the areas of efficiency and scalability. I, I don't intend to be rather uh, to be negative about almost anything in this presentation, but I will be uh, negative about this. If the future direction, which is being strongly considered by such as the Department of Energy and under the National Strategic Computing Initiative, where much of the money may go, if that is based on the assumption of being able to maintain the success that we've had at uh, the petascale regime into the exascale regime by incremental advances to conventional practices, then there is a fundamental piece of hypocrisy there, period. And you can measure it, and others measure it as well. Success to me is not 4% efficiency. Right? Even thermodynamics lets you do better than that. And nor is it 90% efficiency on a LINPAC benchmark, HPL. Right? Efficiency uh, today for real-world problems, uh, which are often multiscalar and multiphysics, 
uh, are single digit efficiencies. And for some problems, and I'm not the one most qualified to provide this data, uh, it can be much less. It can be below 1%. Now, if that is our definition of success and we want to retain that success, that means that uh, when we hit an exaflops, we're throwing away 900 petaflops or worse. So we, we have a problem there. Efficiency and scalability. So the, the strength through weakness argument is if our efficiency is so low, then if we can do something to improve that uh, significantly, then we, we have probably as much as an order of magnitude headroom there. And scalability, uh, if we can move that by two orders of magnitude by exposing parallelism, then we're in good shape. So where are the opportunities? Well, um, the opportunities, in my opinion, are in the area of runtime systems, and I suspect that you feel that uh, that may be the case or you wouldn't be at this meeting, uh, as well as, and I will end my presentation on this topic, potential opportunities in architecture. Now, uh, another sidebar comment. There is significant amount of work that has been done in the area of runtime system over the last half dozen years. Without, without question, the uh, uh, leading uh, pathfinding work has been done here uh, by Sanjay Kali and his team over the last 20 years and change. Uh, there is a sense in the community who have not actually been involved in this that, well, one runtime system may be as good as another, and we need to bake off, and then we'll just choose one. Uh, that turns out to be pretty meaningless. And it, it's meaningless for the following reason. Uh, uh, as Sanjay will attest, uh, many different runtime systems have been developed, and this is the case at uh, Indiana University, uh, as an experimental testbed to explore certain aspects of application uh, behavior uh, and emergent uh, operational properties on distinct uh, systems. And to, to uh, through that exploration, uh, expose opportunities and ideas, uh, gestate uh, ideas for improved computing, uh, computing systems. So some people uh, have developed uh, runtime systems directly to support a particular algorithm or class, uh, class of algorithms or a particular application. Others have just been enamored with the idea of runtime systems per se, and the reason to develop runtime system has been to develop a runtime system. Uh, in our case, the uh, use, uh, the development of runtime system a is as an experimental framework, almost a scaffolding that allow us to explore the cross-cutting uh, uh, characteristics of the entire system related to, first, a semantic execution model. I'll say a little bit about that, parallax. Uh, secondly, to a performance model, uh, the one we use is called slower, and I'll explain that briefly as well. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the relationships between uh, programming interfaces and uh, the runtime system via the compilers and the compilers via the operating systems to the architecture. So for us, the end product is not a runtime system. The uh, end product is knowledge about how to make better systems that will operate orders of magnitude faster and, and more effective. So I've already stated that there seem to be, and I'm perfectly satisfied with this, two major classes of uh, uh, two major directions in which the future of uh, execution management uh, will, will be pursued. Yet in fairness uh, to both sides, if, if this is a side-to-side -side, uh, consideration, uh, the truth is we are learning both from our own experiences and from each other's experiences. And so what was a purely static approach is, is trending towards more dynamic pieces built within a, a static framework. And uh, in the case of pure dynamic approaches, the recognition and exploitation of static optimizations when possible at the programming, uh, the load time or the compiler technique, especially in areas of load balancing, uh, is, uh, is also happening. So I don't want to claim, in fact, I don't even believe that there will be an ultimate convergence, but I do believe that the realities of the stress points in achieving uh, ultra-scale computing uh, is uh, driving uh, wealth, uh, well-intended, well-thinking research projects uh, toward into similar uh, directions. Okay, so a little bit of pedagogy here. 
uh, j just so that I can use terms that we can all agree on them. I, I, I am, I, I, my understanding of the history, and, and it's uh, somewhat embarrassing to admit that I've lived through that history. I was born within a few months of the first working stored program digital computer. I'm not proud of that fact, uh, but uh, I have, uh, you know, in one way or another, I've seen it all. I show you the first computers I programmed on uh, were vacuum tubes and uh, punch cards. And while I was glad to get rid of the vacuum tubes, I miss the punch cards even today. They make wonderful bookmarks. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and, you know, when you think about it, here, here's, the, here's a skill set that none of the students here actually have to worry about, and that is to hand punch in hollerith. All right, so this is something that we could do without having to look up anything and, and, and make, these, uh, make these cards. I, I thought they'd be forever. I mean, who would trust magnetic media uh, uh, for, for your data? Well, okay, among my many visionary inputs, four key factors that are valid no matter what piece of that history. And by the way, I, I assert that there are six, uh, six epics, five points of punctuated equilibrium where computing concepts, the paradigms themselves, as well as the supporting architectures and uh, programming methodologies have changed over another 60 to 70 years. And those are, uh, and these are sources of performance degradation, so they, they all sound negative. Um, uh, so starvation, uh, you could see this is the positive, it would be parallelism, right? But starvation is critical. It is the absence of sufficient work to keep resources busy, uh, either because of a, a lack of to a totality of work for that, and this uh, occurs very much in the runtime, uh, I'm sorry, in, um, in the strong scale problem sets, uh, as well as uh, just because of poor load balancing where there's too much work in one place and too little work on another. Now even that was an overly simplistic comment uh, because of the other three factors, latency, the, the time uh, distance, uh, to uh, remote accesses and services, uh, overhead that additional work, and this is, the, this is really fundamental to the big paradox of runtime systems, uh, that uh, work that you have to do, that work is extra work in order to manage the task scheduling and, and, and resource and do the resource management uh, of, of these systems to exploit the dynamic uh, adaptive techniques that become possible through these runtime systems. But overhead is, is, um, uh, has other nuanced uh, uh, characteristics that, first of all, make it not orthogonal to, say, such problems as starvation. Because it can be shown, and I'll show you in a moment, that, uh, that overhead actually dom can dominate the, the total amount of performance that can be achieved for, and this is in the area of fixed work, uh, independent of the amount of hardware you throw at it. This is a, 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 a well-known concept that very few, very, in some cases, very good people simply don't get. But before I get to that, um, uh, finally, there's this notion of contention. That is to say, the delays incurred, the waiting that results from uh, uh, multiple requests to a shared resource. A shared resource can be a, a memory bank. It can be a, a network port. Uh, it can be an ALU uh, in, in, the, um, in, uh, in a particular uh, core. Uh, together, these and other factors such as reliability and uh, energy uh, together give you an estimate of average performance. And I emphasize average because there's a tremendous uh, statistical, very, very uh, wide variation that can occur under these conditions. But here's the key thing. Every system that has been certainly commercially available, and many which have never gotten further than research systems, can be assessed, can be analyzed in terms of these simple factors. And how the concepts of those systems address either implicitly by happenstance or explicitly by intent, how they address these issues determines their uh, effectiveness in, in performing um, uh, computing uh, at the next stage. So here's a, a, one of these curves that becomes so overly normalized in the horizontal and vertical axis that they actually doesn't mean anything, All right? Except what it means is the trend. So this is a, this curve. This is analytical, but simply shows the the issue of the relationship of overhead 
for fixed size work in an idealized case, the overhead with respect to the total amount of parallelism that's available. And the key issue to note here is on the right-hand side that the curve, basically, if you carry it out, they flatline. And the implication simply is, that anybody can do this, it's high school algebra, the implication is that for fixed size work, strong scale problems, uh, and with the best possible uh, breakdown and, and uh, partitioning of, of the uh, parallelism in there, the overhead imposed by the system on the control of that parallelism will provide a, uh, uh, an, uh, an upper bound on the performance that can be achieved. If we try to build a more complex uh, uh, performance model, uh, there may be bright people in this room who can do this analytically. We can't. We haven't. We've failed. Uh, so we fall back and work with numerical solutions based, in our case, on, on queuing models. And here's a case where, again, we, we show uh, the amount of parallelism uh, and overhead uh, in this place. We relate it to the latency of the system uh, that uh, is, is experienced by the computation. And then we compare this to a, a baseline of um, a standard block BSP-like computation. And uh, so the vertical axis is, is the re re relative performance advantage of using dynamic versus uh, uh, static systems in this case. And what is immediately clear is that there is a, uh, a less sensitive rough area plateau in which the computation can operate in a number of different points, which is a good thing because there are other factors that come into play in the optimization curve itself. But past certain key thresholds in these dominant parameters, it's over the cliff. And this is very important because it is this kind of model that needs to be used in the policies of runtime systems as those runtime systems, again, manage the, the resources and uh, schedule the tasks. And what I haven't said, but I should add in there, is um, uh, also uh, migrate uh, the work and or the data uh, for uh, some, some degrees of uh, load balancing. Every time you talk about load balancing, by the way, What's the uh, first thing you have to worry about? It's the overhead for doing that load balancing. And so, uh, unfortunately, that overhead determines suboptimal solutions are generally optimal. And I'm misusing, I'm abusing the term optimality here because in truth, you don't know the optimal solution uh, because it's largely non-causal. And, and so you really don't know what the solution should have been until you had finished the problem. Uh, but um, I, I would say, what's the point then? Of course. Quite correctly, people will say the post-mortem analysis can be employed in advanced smart learning uh, uh, policies. So, the, uh, as, as Sanjay said, um, I, I, and I, I really didn't mean to take on this role, but I, I have become a little bit of a proselytizer for the notion of uh, execution models. I didn't realize that. I thought everybody talked execution models. Right? And that's because I was, I was brought up in, a, in almost as weird a place as, as this campus. Um, uh, at, uh, at MIT, and, and uh, MIT suffered and benefited enormously, both cases, by wallowing in the value of abstraction. And uh, that, so that was a good thing, right? The bad thing was they didn't know how to connect it to reality. So that's why you got list machines out of uh, Cambridge and you got risk architectures out of California. And you know which way we went on that. So why, why, why an execution model? Well, let me put it very simply. It, it says, you know, we can talk about uh, compilers. We can talk about operating systems, talk about computer architecture, my favorite topic. Uh, we can talk about algorithms. We can talk about programming interfaces. How do you talk about all of them together in one lexicon? Okay, you don't. You, you take them apart, and there's a different set of, of issues and topics and, and uh, viewpoints and, on each one. Yet a computing system, computing itself, is a holistic synergy, really a symbiotic relationship of each of these layers with each of the other layers, all of them contributing ultimately to answer the most important question, so important, so obvious, we never even talk about it, 
Where is an action going to occur? When is an action going to occur? And of course, what is that action? This is um, Bill Carlson, uh, father of UPC. He and uh, Kathy Ellick and I wrote a book on UPC. Um, uh, he, 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 he gave this an unfortunate name, coincidization. But where in time and space is everything in the right place at the right time? All right. An execution model is, at least abstractly, a lexicon. It is a, uh, um, a model that allows us to consider all of the elements working together. And it's very important because it allows us to partition the kinds of contributions that each of those layers, both statically and dynamically, can contribute at the same time that we can measure in terms of its contributions of overhead uh, and uh, the delays that are incurred, uh, as well as the amount of parallelism that ex it's expo exposing. So the parallax execution model was experimentally developed uh, and it continues to mature. Uh, that's a polite way of saying we keep finding out how we got it wrong and, and, and we have to fix it. Or, and more excitingly, uh, once in a while, the model insists the way it has to be rather than us... Uh, um, uh, telling it uh, how to be. And this is more of an issue of discovery uh, rather than of design. And, and when you're in that groove, you know you're doing, you're doing right things. So we care, about the, we care about execution models. Certainly the dominant model over the last two decades has been the communicating sequential processes models and its derivatives, uh, initially um, uh, uh, promulgated by uh, Tony Hoare in the late 1970s. Before that, well, you can go back and you know the history of computing. So the parallax model will look very familiar to people in this room. And unfortunately, uh, there are, while there may be details that differentiate it, some of them I think are rather elegant. I simply don't have time. Uh, this is not really a parallax talk, but I, I do want to show it. So, it is uh, multitask in the sense that we have uh, small task actions that uh, routinely are referred to as threads. But in fact, we refer to them as complexes, not to simply confuse our, our, our community or representation, but because a thread implies, or one infers, uh, that at the at core is a sequentiality of, of action items. And, and that's certainly true in most of the real implementations. But in fact, in the parallax model, the more, under, uh, the more fundamental core of uh, uh, data flow precedent constraint uh, management of ordering or the, or the uh, a partial ordering set of operations is actually embedded. Now, any compiler can take that and, and turn it into a sequential thread. In fact, that's pretty much what it does. And then, of course, the hardware, <laughs> the hardware takes that sequential ordering uh, and then tears it apart again, at least a part of its data flow model, the use of reservation stations, the Thomas Solo algorithm, and, and so forth. There, are, there have been certain models in the use of multi-threading where they uh, uh, would like the advantage of non-preemptive threads and uh, purely functional uh, threads. That is to say, uh, the, only the input and the outputs have any opportunity for global mutable side effects. They're non-preempted so they can predict what the timing will be. Uh, some good work at Intel has been based on this notion. The term codelets has been applied. Nice work if you can get it. But the edge conditions of computation do not allow you to exclusively operate that way. So in, in our case, we uh, permit that kind of uh, usage patterns, but we go on um, and, and support preemptive, preemptive work, uh, migration of threads. Uh, the other thing that our, 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 our uh, complexes uh, do is that they are first class objects. Now, that may sound like much ado about nothing or just another one of these crazy abstraction, terribly critical. And, and I, I'd like people who are thinking about runtimes uh, to, to think in these terms, to unify the namespaces, not just of the data, but the data and the control. And this is because indeed control in a highly dynamic way is driven by data dependencies. And those dependencies are not always predictable at uh, load time or compile time. Uh, you see these uh, overriding arcs with arrows at one end, and these are the method, what we might refer to method-driven computation. Uh, the concepts go back easily to the 1970s with data flow uh, computing, Dennis, Arvind, and many, many others uh, in that area, uh, where you're able to move the work to the data 
and therefore have the impact on latency. Uh, in addition, we support uh, the idea of uh, semantically powerful synchronization constructs. Uh, while the user can, can devise their own, and there's a generic operation that's inherited uh, to this, uh, the two principal ones that seem to find the greatest favor in exploiting uh, parallelism uh, for dynamic exploitation is uh, the data flow uh, synchronization construct itself and the uh, actors base, the actors model base futures construct. This, this has been known for three decades, but has not until recently been uh, focused outside of, um, outside of the research environment. <clears throat> and I think that uh, futures will become incredibly important, especially as the metadata for, for big data, uh, for uh, deep learning, and, and for larger dynamic graph processing uh, be, become, become essential. Uh, on your right, there is um, uh, some heterog um, heterogeneous computing for those who uh, want uh, GPUs or the equivalent. And uh, in addition, there is the notion organizing uh, principle of uh, processes, hardly a new idea, but differentiating is um, the fact that processes within the parallax universe uh, can span multiple nodes. We call nodes locality, again, just to confuse all the terminology. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we get both user, pro uh, user productivity and performance portability out of this. Indeed, I gave a talk in, in uh, uh, Moscow. I don't remember when, maybe September. Uh, and uh, 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 Bill Gropp was there and, and a number of other colleagues whom, whom uh, you know, Satoshi Matsuoko. And what, what, one of the experiences, so I'm jumping ahead to my conclusion, but one of the experiences has been that, that our intention, as I had said in the beginning, was to understand how to derive new classes of systems, cross-cutting systems. And I still believe that, that that will be an artifact, or consequence, an outcome of this work if it's successful. But it, what it has done, is, and you've experienced exactly the same thing here in the Charm++ Plus Plus community, and, and certainly before us, is it has provided a framework for certain classes of applications. So it has been, it, it is greatly facilitated for certain problems, mostly those dynamic problems uh, in time and uh, irregular in form that uh, benefit uh, from having a, a framework that manages and controls all that. Now, um, I, so I'm going to say the, the thing that's just never said in a university. It is the professors who learn from the students, not the students who learn from the professors. In almost every case, what a student might learn from a professor, he or she can get out of a textbook. But what the professors learn is when the students ask questions that had not been asked before, or come up with really stupid ideas that are great. And um, uh, for me, uh, one of those was uh, related to the notion of uh, semantic modeling of an execution model. Well, first of all, that was stupid of me because I should have known. I mean, Tony Hoare, in fact, did uh, precisely that, although using different techniques that we did. I, I'm fortunate now that uh, I have uh, colleagues who are expert in operational semantics. And so without going into detail, uh, at this point, uh, Parallax has now been modeled using operational semantics. And uh, this has turned out to be great because just by doing that, we have discovered areas of... Uh, inconsistency uh, and incompleteness. And so just by trying to model it, we've learned where there have been, again, I use the term edge conditions that uh, we have gone back. There's another value to this, uh, two multiple other values, but one is it serves as a means of technology transfer. By having a formal model, yes, yes. Just a question at this point. Yes. That's correct. But, but, no, no, this is, you're quite right, Sanjay. Uh, and this is what I would say is the experimental um, uh, issue. Uh, that, uh, that it is. Operational semantics are used uh, for definition of programming languages. 
And so it was a creative idea, not mine, by the way. It was a creative idea of uh, um, some colleagues of mine of would we be able to take an execution model and still benefit from the power, the semantic power of operational semantics. And it is proven to be the case. And, uh, you know, I should have gotten that. You know, I should have been the one saying we need to do this. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it's turning out to be uh, even better than I thought for, for two additional reasons. One, and, and this is related to the programming language idea, it allows us to determine compliance so is a runtime system or is a programming language compliant with an execution model? Or for that matter, is an architecture compliant with an execution model? Where does it ordinarily show up? By, by the way, it's probably in namespaces, global namespaces. So both technology transfer and compliance makes this a much more rigorous, a much stronger method. Now I will, I will follow Sanjay's lead and talk about the manifestation for the purposes of exploiting conventional systems <clears throat> today um, of, of the runtime system. So I try very hard to, to exhibit intellectual integrity by referring not to the HPX5 runtime system, but to the experimental HPX5 runtime system. If I were to try to sell or impose our work on any of you, it would be merely as a framework for conducting experimentation. Now, as it happens, uh, and I, I know this, the history of Charm++ Plus Plus very well, and it certainly has happened here successfully, uh, is that it leapfrogs ahead of where it should be and is actually being used for, for real applications that desperately need it. One such application, uh, very pleased and in collaboration with colleagues both at Purdue University and University of Notre Dame under the Department of Energy's uh, National Nuclear Security Agency PSAP-2 program, I got all of that in, uh, is a, a, a five-year program to do a uh, shockwave physics prob materials problem through reactive material uh, which literally the shockwave causes the hybrid material to chemically change and in so doing actually therefore changes its properties, specifically its propagation properties, so that the reflections of those shockwaves now go through the same material again, superimposed on top of each other but with different propagation properties. This is a very complicated problem. Right. And yet it has extremely practical uh, results in, among other things, depending on your point of view, producing a material that is superior to diamond in most ways, or, and I should be able to spew forth what the name is, but, it's, it, it, but it has things like you'd hear on cable television, zirconium, this and that, and so on. Maybe you can, you can buy it in a cheap ring uh, eventually. Uh, but it's also used for um, uh, reactive materials in... in unfortunately, in the field of conflict uh, for the uh, tanks and um, uh, other, other uh, vehicles. So it's, it has a practical protective aspect there. This is a, 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 a structure, not even mine. It uh, emerged from um, uh, Office of Science and Department of Energy uh, that uh, shows a uh, hierarchy. There's a, there are many such software, st uh, well, such system stack uh, structures the um, uh, interesting thing about this is on your left, uh, you find a number of properties, a number of characteristics, which are cross-cutting. So as I said at the beginning, we, we don't just deal explicitly and uniquely with a compiler or with a, an operating system and so forth, but there are a number of ways that they all contribute together holistically with an emergent property, for an example, of, um, of resilience or productivity, or that together are guided by a single execution model. At the bottom, you, you have uh, the hardware, and at the uh, next major step up is a complex of uh, hierarchical, let's call them operating systems, uh, but in fact, it's more complicated than that because usually there are uh, node systems or even core systems, and then they're expanded across the system or not. Uh, the, it is the middle level that we're discussing here, and that is the runtime systems, which, again, I believe this room appreciates. But, but indeed, perhaps the biggest question today, which I will not address uh, until the uh, panel, uh, is the issue of programming environments and tools. 
And while I have fairly strong opinions on almost everything in that area, it is not false humility to say, I don't know the answer. And I am agnostic and I am looking for good ideas into how to adapt both the needs of the system and the algorithms, and yet equally important, the needs of the community, the legacy software, uh, and the skill sets which are assumed and, and currently adopted. So here's a, a, a fluffy block diagram of, of the HPX5 runtime system. Each of, the, each of the boxes represents a piece of functionality. Now, we, we naively had thought that uh, this block diagram would suggest a fairly um, uh, decomposable functionality where one group could write... Uh, uh, write the scheduler, and another group could write the uh, global address manager, and another could handle uh, the processes, and another could handle uh, the message-driven computation. And that was the plan. Our, uh, under uh, Sandia National Laboratory's leadership, uh, two different sources of components from the runtime system uh, community, uh, Louisiana State University, extremely good work being done there uh, with an emphasis on uh, C++, uh, and uh, the Boost Library opportunities, and they've contributed directly to the changes that have taken place uh, in C++ to provide some parallelism and have uh, strong collaborations uh, in uh, the European Union uh, as well. And we were going to handle some parts of this too, and then we were going to glue them together. That was going to be called HPX4. Uh, their system, HPX3, sometimes they just refer to it as HPX. It predated our own and HPX5, our own system. What we found was they simply don't decompose, uh, that there are design decisions in each of these blocks that are sensitive to the design requirements and decisions as well as the protocols of other blocks. Fortunately, we didn't uh, just blow ourselves forward in this, uh, we, we came up to the right solution. So we told DOE they're going to get two for the price of one, and uh, that's what, what they got. Now, uh, just uh, credit where credit is due, and as you all know, there, there are a number of runtime systems which are being pursued nationally, and uh, also, which I have not included, uh, a runtime system such as the Open uh, OMPSS, I used to know it at STARS out of Barcelona, uh, a, a very good system, and they've changed the name, so I don't remember the name of the system coming out of uh, uh, Riken and others uh, in uh, Japan, and I'm sure there are others as well, so this is not in any way meant to be uh, exhaustive. We are, uh, we do interact with our, our friends at Rice, Vivek Sarkar and company on OCR, uh, looking for alignments there, and uh, we are working uh, at, at an early stage with uh, Dharma out of uh, uh, Sandia National Laboratories at Livermore as, a, as an interface. By the way, uh, do you interact with the Dharma people? Okay, okay, uh, because they seem, they seem appropriately open uh, uh, to, to building, um, uh, building systems, and they may provide applications we wouldn't otherwise uh, get. Now, I've actually already covered uh, in passing most of uh, the points here. There are a few additional things which are just outside the scope of this discussion, such as the power and importance of, um, of uh, distributed parallel control state uh, and the use of copy semantics uh, with a class of constructs called distributed uh, control operations. Now, these DCOs, in fact, are built on top of and with uh, the use of uh, futures and, and data flow. Um, but they allow us to build very sophisticated graph structures, both for control purposes, uh, which I'd love to have a, be able to give a talk on, and, and for uh, many key applications. Um, there's, I'm just going to drift off for a second. So there's one true elegant uh, result, and this may be true for the uh, uh, stuff that you guys do. I just don't know if this is part of Charm++. Plus Plus. But um, did I miss something? I did miss something there. Sorry, I just blew through. So this is a this is a state diagram of the lifetime uh, or the life cycle of uh, a complex a, a thread. Inside the blue uh, region is the exec is the runtime system. So uh, a, um, a thread can exist either in the runtime system or out of the runtime system. What is important to understand is scalability. 
And ultimately, you need your runtime systems on the individual nodes to be essentially order constant scaling as you move from tens to hundreds to tens of thousands of nodes as we move up to exascale and as the number of cores increase uh, uh, per socket and, and per node. So such trivial things as, as counters and buffers and queues uh, and uh, the bandwidth of, of, e, of uh, uh, queues <clears throat> needs to be able to stay constant, independent of what order of magnitude system scale you have. So you have to make sure that you can get, you can uh, contr uh, manage the um, uh, thread state at times, but outside of the runtime system. And that happens here in that little state D, which stands for depleted. And yeah, that comes from depleted uranium. I don't know, it's a, it's a metaphor. Um, somebody corrected me. He said, it's not a metaphor, it's a simile. I still don't know what the difference between a metaphor and a simile is. I keep meaning to Google it, but you know, you can have a long conversation and never debate about metaphors and similes, not to mention anal an an analogies. Okay, the, here, here's the, here it is, crisply. A thread which is suspended, if it's really suspended, I mean taken out of the runtime system, will have the same semantics as a control object, as a futures or a data flow object. The point is you can build constructs of suspended threads that are actually a control graph. We knew that was wrong, went back to fix it, turned out it was true. Uh, and uh, it's, a tr it, it's a tremendous unifying principle, and one we should, we should look at to see if, if, if it is aligned with charm plus plus, because I believe it's inherent in the nature, and, and um, uh, it, it, it's very powerful. Uh, in particular, it's very powerful for NP-complete problems, where you need the computation to manage the finite memory resources. And um, uh, uh, we, we can talk about that offline. So sorry, but it's, it's a very exciting part here. All right, so I've touched all that. So let's see, how am I doing on time? We have 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes. Okay, that's great, that's great. Um, now I'm gonna blow through some numbers. Uh, all these slides will be pr uh, uh, made available and uh, our purpose is to, uh, uh, my purpose right now is just to motivate you to take a look at one or more of these in case you find them interesting. I said that uh, Parallax, uh, I'm sorry, HPX is intended as an experimental framework. Uh, and uh, one of the key factors is to understand what the overhead costs are and the latency costs um, because these provide bounding conditions on the degree of parallelism that you can exploit and the, uh, the frequency with which you can do such uh, optimizing dynamic operations such as load balancing. So I'm just gonna blow through these. This is, uh, this is one of those double-edged swords, right? So it's good news, bad news in every case. I'll just tell you what the conclusion is. The good news is that, uh, and, and those of you who have contributed to the kernels um, of a, uh, Charm++ plus plus will appreciate this, that uh, uh, it's hard, right? It, it's hard to, to write this code so that it's efficient. And, and it, took us, it took us years. Uh, we, we have graphs that, sh that, that are sort of the kind of crying on the pillow graphs, where we show the slow, painful progress from something that is like 10 times too slow to something that's 30 percent too slow, that's then 10 percent better. This was, this was not done easily. This was, this was painful. We know that some of these, no, so that's the positive. We are now at a point where our numbers are where they should be almost, and that's the negative. They're not good enough, and they're probably not going to get good enough through software. They will get somewhat better. You will probably have numbers uh, for Charm++. Plus Plus. I, I certainly know that other colleagues, we've shared these numbers. So these are about mechanisms, low-level mechanisms. The one that you're looking at right now is, uh, is, is a primitive, it's a, pr uh, it's a predicate that simply says, is the reference I'm making going to be satisfied within the locality or the node in which the request is resident, or is it going to be remote? That, that, that is, in a, in a global address-based system, that's, that's an essential 
number. You would like that to be single cycle. After all, why do microprocessor cores have TLBs? It's in some sense to answer an analogous question with regards to virtual, virtual memory. And as you can, well, I hope you can see, uh, the, you get two messages out of this. First, we do a really good job at this. We're way down uh, most of the time uh, at or below 100 nanoseconds. Second, there's a long tail here. And we need to understand better what contributes to that uncertainty, that asynchrony, that variability. Uh, and um, there was a third thing I wanted to say. Oh, yes. And uh, remember, we're talking about on nominally 2 gigahertz clock rates. So if, that's, uh, if that is 100 uh, nanosecond, that's 200 instruction cycles which is still a lot for something that you would really like to be um, in one cycle. Similarly, the uh, time required to do a context switch. Now, those of us who are old enough, and I see a few, hello, Bill. Um, uh, the, we remember Burton's uh, uh, Herculean efforts to make this one cycle. Originally, when it was implemented in gallium arsenide, if I have that right, it was 200 megahertz. Uh, but he was able to do a context switch in a single cycle in the hardware. And, and that uh, technology is still, I believe, is still available from Cray under the MXT. Eureka. Eureka. Okay, thank you. So we know that the proof of concept in hardware that allows us to do that, most, most systems uh, do not even hyper-threading. Well, that's only two. <laughs> Sorry. I... Um, yeah, I won't go there. Um, uh, the, the, uh, but, but you see here that we're, again, we're, uh, we're down there, but um, if you just want to eyeball it, something on the order of half a microsecond. So that means that we, in order to break even, we need to be running threads no less than about 1,000 instruction issues. When we drive the creation of those threads with, uh, uh, with our parcels, our equivalent to active messages with a little additional trend, uh, we're able to, in fact, um, uh, create, this is not context switching, but create the thread in, uh, in, in very good time, in about a, a quarter of a microsecond. So that's good. Um, uh, but when you look more closely at the number of instructions, you find that there's a wide variation. And yes, you're, you're looking at that tall pole there and wondering what happened. Well, I suspected and I was right. We get TLBs. We get TLB misses. And a TLB miss is just very, very expensive. And you have to uh, worry about that. We have other measurements as well. Let me just blow through this. I'd like to touch on this. So we look very closely at issues of uh, cache misses. Here's a, a case where we're looking at um, uh, L1, L2, and L3 caches. We are masochists. We run codes in which we know a priori will do poorly on because it provides us a baseline and a bounding condition. And Lulish, a well-known uh, code, um, uh, from uh, Livermore uh, is uh, one such code. It, it's almost ideal for uh, conventional practices and MPI implementation, and we compare against that, that implementation. Uh, this, um, sorry, I'm, yes, okay. And this also shows uh, TLB misses. So here are the TLB misses themselves. The incident rate is relatively small. Uh, and here we're comparing it for decomposition. So if we increase the number of the amount of parallelism available compared to the number of physical threads, we find that we get a number of improved properties. I'll show you a couple more in a moment. We find here, supposedly, the, uh, the caches are, are doing better. Uh, and what was the difference? Oh, there are two different systems. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and again, we see the, uh, we see the caches uh, here. These are L1, L2, and L, L3 misses. Uh, depending on uh, uh, a small number of, um, uh, uh, this is a factor of eight in, in our, decomp our decomposition. And supposedly what you get from this is an impression that, okay, you're, you're going to mitigate uh, cache misses through, um, through the process of a degree of over-decomposition, not so fast. 
So in fact, what we discovered is when we look more closely that we are in fact seeing a sweet spot, that it is a non-monotonic optimization curve, and that it is much more critical that you understand exactly where the property, what the properties of the system, hardware and software, are in, in determining this in order to uh, get that. So you can swamp out uh, the system. Here, uh, running uh, um, uh, traces, uh, again, using a decomposition. This one is, uh, this is Lulish again, all right? And you see the amount of, uh, when we're end, we're end with one, uh, and we go ahead and we, we uh, continue with the next phase. Um, th these alignments make it pretty clear we're actually, we're actually doing what Lulish, the, the conventional Lulish does, and that's almost a BSP representation. But uh, if we uh, overcompose it and relax the global barriers, well, here, a problem that's very good in conventional practice is nonetheless, we get just under 20% improvement uh, in... Um, uh, in this uh, problem area. So let me uh, just uh, burst forward here. Um, uh, ever since I was a, a first year grad student at MIT back in 77, uh, people were running uh, uh, galaxy crashing problems on very simple machines, one, one megaflops machines. And uh, of course, the, the accuracy and resolution, the tidal behaviors are, uh, are much more, um, uh, much higher fidelity now. And you know, we should all be worried about this, right? I mean, in a mere five billion years, that's us. All right, so you know, M31, here we come. And they're bigger than we are, so think about that. Uh, so Lulish, let's see, I'm just gonna show you a movie here, if I can. Sorry, I never can, here we go. work. All right, so uh, I just like the graphic. This is, a, this is Lulish uh, with one-on-one -on -one composition and with multi uh, uh, or de decomposition. Uh, I think it's a factor of eight, but I may be wrong. And with the removal of the global barriers and uh, representing the control using data flow synchronization. And what you're seeing moving around are the particles. Now, the key thing about this is they're actually in sync, time-wise. So simulation time is right on. And um, the, co the computation is going much faster, boom, and uh, allowing uh, for much more of the interaction with um, uh, the uh, collective operations, which are those red and blue things around the periphery. Uh, and the little gray things are the actual uh, activities going on. And so this is, a, this is a, a, just an example that there's a lot more overlap of computation to communication. Here with uh, Lulish on a, a small cluster, what, this is a few nodes. Uh, we, we are able to expose, uh, and, and there are a lot of caveats about this, but here's a case where we show um, a measurable uh, improvement, uh, so, you know, well within a factor two, of course, but a measurable improvement by uh, using dynamic methods and over decomposition uh, compared to um, uh, conventional MPI. In fact, in this particular instance, the MPI actually did worse with over decomposition on some systems, like the XCs out of Cray, you're not even allowed to do this. But as we extend further, and I don't think this is as new a curve, uh, but we're, we're able to see that there are a number of additional factors that come into play. So one thing that MPI really does so well is some of those collective operations, so the uh, scatters uh, and some of the reduction operations uh, that occur. And those do not scale favorably with a number of cores, and so there's this creeping in degradation that occur. All right, th these were uh, in HPCG. So let me jump ahead. Um, just a couple. I'm conscious of the time, sorry. This is the wavelet problem, and uh, similar as before, the time is, a, is, uh, is the same. And through the, uh, the uh, over decomposition uh, and uh, some load balancing, you're watching the communication at different layers in the wavelet abstraction. Uh, this was done again, uh, uh, this is part of our um, uh, FMM or fast multipole methods code. And on your right, you're seeing far more uh, communica effective communication taking place uh, and much weaker communication occurring uh, before. And 
Do I get one more? You were always supposed to show your baby pictures. Right, so I, I really like this one. This is um, a gamma ray burst uh, that's occurring. It's using an adaptive mesh refinement technique. I think there are 16 levels of resolution. And, and there are two different wave fronts. The inner wave front is actually pushing harder than the outer wave front. The uh, curvature that you see is an emergent property. It wasn't programmed in. And as you see in the lighter blue, this is where you're getting the turbulence because of the collision, the tension uh, of these. And no, we don't have an MPI version of this uh, because you'd end up writing uh, the equivalent of charm plus plus or HPX uh, just to, to do that. And then finally, One more time. All right, so this is, this is uh, uh, Kelvin uh, Helmholtz instability. Uh, you see this uh, often. Again, it's uh, uh, another, this is another, uh, although different AMR algorithm that you're seeing. And you, you can tell that the, the, the turbulence is building up, which uh, has high fidelity with respect to the uh, real, I was going to say ground truth, but obviously that's not ground. Um, against the, the reality is very powerful. And one, one, one last thing, I don't have a movie on this yet, but uh, I, was in, um, I was in Geneva uh, last week uh, at uh, EPFL uh, working uh, with uh, the Blue Brain Project uh, on, on brain simulation. This is absolutely fascinating, fascinating problem, and very controversial and so forth. Um, uh, we had one of their scientists visit us last summer, and in less than a month, actually implement uh, a, a subset of the total uh, what, a neuron code, uh, Michael, Michael Hines from Yale. And we were able to show that we could get it even slightly better than the uh, MPI plus OpenMP codes uh, that, we were, that, that they're currently running uh, in, uh, at EPFL. So let me finish up by, I'm going the wrong way. All right, let me finish up by, uh, just touching on the last topic. I'll make this fast. One of the things that both excites me and frustrates me is that we live in the field, most rapidly, rapidly growing field in the history of human technology, right? I mean, you, you just can't exaggerate this. If I said in a single lifetime our technology has improved by a trillion fold, that would sound like hyperbole, but in fact, it would be understating the case by at least an order of magnitude. And it wasn't as if we got it wrong or we were building machines out of marbles and water. You know, it was pretty steady, more than a factor of two orders of magnitude every decade. And you'd think with that kind of incredibly revolutionary ability that we would not be so conservative. And yet we are, we are amazingly conservative. Maybe not as conservative as civil engineers, but, but, but really conservative. And so, so I offer you this list for you to peruse at some other time of a number of unquestioned assumptions that are intrinsic to the classes of systems. And this is not me ranting, there's a reason for this, right? First and foremost is the notions that the floating point ALU is the precious resource. You look at uh, any, uh, uh, any um, uh, core layout on a die, you see that that whole memory hierarchy and so much other control complexity is there to keep the ALU busy. You know, when I was as young as some of the people in this room, that was a good, uh, that was a good objective function. Uh, I remember fixing an a single bit of an ALU that was this big, all right? It was a transistor board in a, in a, in a PDP-5. Go Google it, all right? Single bit. I had to change the transistor, put it back in, and that, that, that bit uh, on the ALU worked. Uh, I have seen in museums the single bit, for example, out of the whirlwind computer. Uh, you can see it at the Smithsonian or at the West Coast Museum. And, and that thing is, is like this big with the vacuum tubes, right? But that's not the case anymore. It is among the smallest pieces of, of hardware, lowest the actual ALU in terms of uh, energy. And yet we continue to build, we continue to build von Neumann derivative machines at a time when we can no longer uh, afford the luxury of wasting so much uh, space and energy and time. Others, other, that you might find, you might be comfortable with that. Uh, of course, the use of instruction pointers is just part of that whole uh, thing. But you know, we still use binary values. 
We don't have to. Your body doesn't even use binary values. Your DNA is base four, right? Not base two. Maybe nature knew something that we didn't know. We use two-state Boolean logic. We don't need to use two. Boolean logic is a set of logics, not a single logic at base two. Um, we continue to separate the memory from the, from the processing units. It, it's, we called it the von Neumann bottleneck for as long as I knew of, about computing. Yes, there are other issues. We still expect, and it's still a strong debate, that we will continue to use CSP in one form or another, and MPI, and, and with OpenMP, and a number of other assumptions. These assumptions are with us out of tradition, and out of, out of, in some cases, a necessity for practical reasons, uh, and because there's a strong reticence to the point of intransigence that to do differently would be disruptive and break the continuity. And by the way, in some cases that could be true. But much change can be additive, not disruptive, and we should be able to do this. So we've explored a number of areas, and by the way, in, in conjunction with colleagues uh, we've just, uh, at Intel, uh, <clears throat> in places where there can be, uh, in which we can change it. We can move to the, what I refer to as the neo-digital age, still semiconductor, end of Moore's law, atomic granularity, some improvements in technology, 3D stacking, yes, probably die to die, optics, some people favor optics on the die, uh, I'm not qualified to judge. But, um, but we still have architecture that we can drastically change where ALUs become high availability, not high productivity, I'm sorry, uh, high um, uh, uh, utility, uh, because that's the wrong metric. We use, we still process on word basis. We don't need to do that. We shouldn't be doing that. We can process on wide word basis. Uh, we can change the width of um, instructions. This may seem much ado about nothing, but experiments show that uh, a, an average instruction can be four to five and a half bits long without losing any richness in the total semantics using compression techniques, but also using added memory stored in tags on registers. We don't do that. This means that you could not have an instruction register. You could have a thread inner loop register, you much lower, uh, much higher storage density overall, and a lower uh, uh, bandwidth requirements and therefore energy requirements. And uh, we should be, uh, in many cases, we should actually be doing what we've known how to do, and that is data flow. Uh, not, not, not trying to decompose, but actually use data flow representation for that. So under uh, Department of Energy uh, and DARPA funding, we have been exploring a, a, a new class of architectures. Still, I would still call this, at its heart, a von Neumann derivative. Uh, there are, one can go beyond that. But um, that there is the idea that runtime systems and the experience derived therefrom can actually drive the requirements and the opportunities for new classes of architectures that will move us into the exascale era. And uh, I, one of the deep consequences is the elimination of the von Neumann bottleneck and global synchronization, uh, guided but not limited by uh, new execution models, and a number of entirely achievable, no miracle occurs here, changes, in many cases, additions uh, to hardware architecture. In conclusion, I think runtime systems are uh, an area, a most important area currently that's both practical and, and enlightened in exploration of high-end computing and that the future of high-end computing and exascale computing is in fact, will in fact be a product uh, of runtime systems. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Um, yeah, like, like, you, I, like you, I submitted uh, uh, punch cards to uh, vacuum tube machines 
had to fight dinosaurs to get to the computer. But now we're uh, the dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> but um, back then, Burroughs ran an ad in the ACM that said, "Must we use an architecture that is 15 years old?" Referring to von Neumann. Well, the answer is yes, clearly. Um, my my question is, why don't we do more of changing the architecture of their memory. A few years ago, the uh, president of the trade said that his, his hardware people had ideas for improving, but the software people said, we can't program it. And wouldn't something, we seem to be a, a Haskell free group here, but wouldn't something that provides more formal uh, proofs of correctness of your program help in doing that? in solving the problem of, of more flexible architectures or totally different architectures? Uh, well, I think, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, you know, I was at the first meeting in London uh, when the Haskell community was coming together back in around, I don't know, 1990 or so. Uh, and uh, I can recall uh, walking across the campus in, in Ann Arbor with Jack Dennis when he had just been given the Eckert Mockley Award. He was very proud because it was the first time it was given for a non von Neumann architecture. And this poor man, this, this you know, really great person had, had just gotten one of the highest uh, prestige. Uh, he's now a National Academy member, of course. Uh, but he was upset with me because I still believed in global mutable side effects. Um, the uh, uh, the Pro provability is important as long as it's not at the cost of substantial amounts of efficiency. I work closely with a young colleague, uh, uh, Ryan Newton, who uh, uh, strongly supports uh, exactly your point of, of, of contention. One thing that, that I, th I thought you were saying was the relationship in architecture between the role of memory and the role of processing, and they're, they're merging, and uh, uh, known sometimes as processor and memory. Uh, there's been much experimental work, but not commercial uh, not commercial work. Uh, Berkeley certainly did some. Um, uh, but Micron is exploring that space uh, pretty aggressively right now. Yeah. yeah, I've sort of always wondered why when you're like you're doing a matrix multiplying, why do you bring up the result matrix to the CPU? Why don't you have a bunch of CPUs and they go to the memory bus and they say, add this to your memory? And, you know, there's a whole bunch of movement that... Yeah, I, you're exactly right. That's where most of the time and most of the energy is. Uh, when you look at uh, ma matrix vector multiply, we've, we've done the measurements. And um, uh, uh, being able to migrate it so that the, the data outcomes don't have to move, if possible, off the chip is, is the best possible. It also means, however, that those chips have to handle pointers, not just values. Wait for this. So, uh, actually, I should be asking you more questions about the runtime, but I'm going to ask you one because I, uh, clarification that uh, since I've heard uh, this from you, you lamented uh, the uh, the fact that we are in single digit efficiencies and it's well below even what um, uh, engines can, can do for mechanical power and so on. But uh, the but at the same time, in your last slides, you talked about why are we stuck with this idea of measuring ALU-based performance and why, why don't we put memory and processors together? If we measure efficiency by how many of the floating points we keep busy, then we are going to, uh, even with, uh, with these ideas, we're going to make it even lower, isn't it? Uh, that, oh, yes. that efficiency. Yes. So, if you if you use that measurement and you went to an availability based versus a utilization based approach to ALUs, and you continued using that measure of efficiency, which in my hypocritical way I still do, in spite of the fact that I deplore it, uh, then the number will will drop another order of magnitude. And yet, it, queuing theory shows you that's exactly what you want. You do you do not want the delays based on that. Right now, if we succeeded. And, and you've done this, and we have, with over-decomposition. And then you chose as your mechanism, what is the delay time between the instantiation of a thread and the time that it is begun to be executed? That is, lost, that is a lost opportunity time, right. and that's what we want to get rid of. But, but do you have another definition of efficiency in mind to make that earlier point about not being yes, that's single correct. digit? Um, what, what is it? What is it? Well, uh, okay, so... Um, 
uh, there was a, a, a crude attempt, and it failed, to measure productivity, mm. to actually provide a formal definition of productivity, and that uh, uh, from DOE, and after a year and a half of getting nowhere, uh, that didn't happen. Um, I, I will only say that the key parameter is time to completion, time to solution. Right. Uh, and, 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 you, and I'm not certain, and maybe you, you can tell me. Well, I think we desperately need a measure that we can, we can work with so that we're working against the same objective functions uh, for the same applications. Okay, so I know I've run over a little bit. Um, okay, well, let's look for other questions and we need to uh, move uh, and have some discussion afterwards, but if there is uh, one or so urgent question, yes, Jim. So since you, you talk about new architectures and new programming, um, do you have an opinion on GPUs, which are really you know the new architecture commercially for the past ten years or so? Right, <laughs> so, new for the last ten years. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, so I, a couple of things I should say, which I, I maybe doesn't need to be. This isn't the first time we've done attached processing uh, for ALUs. I'm old enough to remember the Ytech chip uh, being put on a board and stuck in things like vaxes uh, and so on. The a problem with, uh, if we're going to talk about the GPUs as they're represented by NVIDIA, uh, is that they're on the wrong end of the PCI bus. I, I think this is, this is acknowledged and recognized and, and was done this way for practical reasons. Um, uh, the second thing is it, it, it has been uh, it, in a fragmented state with respect to the, the namespace of the, the total large uh, parallel systems. I think this is also being acknowledged and that there are incremental steps that are being taken uh, there. You still end up with the notion of heterogeneity. And in my opinion, as long as individuals have to guide the computation um, uh, with that. Uh, you know, um, one of the um, most important best brightest people in our field is, is Bill Daly, who is, I guess, title chief scientist at NVIDIA now, formerly department chair at Stanford. Uh, uh, very few people bright. Just because you, you're, you're the smartest person around doesn't mean you always say the right thing. And sometimes Bill forgets that. And um, uh, at, at a Salishan meeting, he said, you know, the programming language for exascale computing will be CUDA. Okay, so he was kind of laughed off the stage for that. And, 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 and there's good reason for that, uh, because, and a couple of years later, giving a really good keynote address at the International Supercomputing Conference in someplace in Germany, um, he made the statement, parallel programming is easy. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a quote. Um, I gave the third keynote address uh, that, uh, at that conference, and I said that I can't argue with Bill, but, but, but if, if parallel programming is easy, then I would assert that good parallel programming is hard. Uh, and and what, what I'm getting to here is that uh, building special systolic-like structures, simdi-like structures, obviously uh, is ideal for certain patterns, certain workflow patterns, and then, and then not uh, useful um, uh, for, for other, including specifically data-intensive patterns. So I would say it's part of our arsenal, the notion that it's taking over the world, which unfortunately uh, has been stated by too many people who know better, when in fact you look at the actual numbers, you find that um, it has a, a place, but it's not taking over the world in its current form. I expect that there will be the eventual uniform, uh, the, you, you, um, I'm sorry, the merger, uh, as is, has already happened with AMD, and that uh, we will have those available to us, and that it will be the runtime systems that will manage uh, the resources based with information from the compiler. So long term, I'm sanguine. Short term, I get a little pissed off when people tell me that it's taken over the world, but when I do the numbers on the top 500 list, I see that the mainstream machines, which are far more than 90% of all the machines, have less, less than 10% of those machines, I'm sorry, I said less, it's not less, it's 10.1% of those machines, at least at last count, have uh, GPUs, which means essentially 90% don't. That's not my definition of taking over the world. Um, hey, where GPUs are great, it's on your desk side machine. I love it there. I've got one and I use it. 
All right. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, a lot of exciting discussions we can have uh, about the runtime systems and so on. Hopefully, uh, in the break and in the lunch, we'll continue and then in the panel. Uh, so uh, please join me uh, in, in thanking Thomas. And thank you all very much.